Kitchen. Coming for the coffee break. Sorry, I was confused before. Mr. Yuri Maltzup. Mr. Yuri Maltzup. He is a PhD and a professor of economics at the AW Clausen Center for World Business at Carthage College in Wisconsin. He held over a 15-year period various teaching and research positions in Moscow, uh, Russia. Prior to immigrating to the United States in 1989, he was a member of senior team of Soviet economists that worked in President Gorbachev's reforms package of Perestroika. So he has authored nine books and over 200 articles. Welcome. Oh, thank you. <coughs> I can move it. Right all right, thank you very much. Sounded like a nice eulogy. So we will talk. <laughs> this, is, this is not working. OK. <clears throat> All right, so we will talk about global assault on liberty. At least this is not working. This is not working? Oh, okay. I have another now, one. Oh, no, it, it's, it's working. Please. Oh, OK. Please. Technology and Russians do not come together well. I'm also I'm very much afraid of, of this because my cultural development stopped on the Leslie Nielsen movies, and I don't know if you remember <laughs> what happened. <clears throat> uh, yes, so it's very nice to be in Mongolia, definitely. I remember a time when we were all so-called prisoners of friendship, <laughs> and, and uh, Mongolia definitely suffered its share of atrocities by uh, Choi Bol San, by Stalin himself, who even himself murdered a Mongolian prime minister. Um, so these are the, were the kind of the, <clears throat> the awful things, and now it's, it's very good to see that freedom is, is being under attack, not here, but amazingly enough in the United States, which was the beacon of liberty for us, for all of us, for Mongolians, for Russians, for Kyrgyz people. Uh, during the time of the Cold War. Uh, so, the <clears throat> um, so what I would kind of, uh, uh, my, my strong belief is that uh, socialism is not an economic system. I think that you remember maybe Ludwig von Mises, he was absolutely right, saying that the choice between, the choice between socialism and capitalism is not a choice between economic systems. Uh, that it is the same way as the choice of, um, of um, potassium cyanide concoction is, and milk is not the choice uh, between beverages, it's the choice between life and death. And that's exactly, I think, what, what was it. And, <clears throat> and the, the problem today is that the United States is under, I would say, the siege, and the siege of of, uh, of the same ideology, which completely ruined 11 time zones of the Soviet Union and another 34 countries on this planet uh, since, the, since 1917. Um, the, and I would, would say I defected to the United States in 1989, and I just don't want to defect again to old. <laughs> so that's the, <clears throat> we have a, <clears throat> We have uh, one of our major political parties, uh, members of which believe 57% of them believe that socialism is superior to capitalism. Can you imagine that? Then we have uh, some public opinion polls that about 60% of our college students, they prefer socialism to capitalism as well. Well, <clears throat> because I'm teaching, the only good thing about it is that most of them, they don't know what socialism is. And uh, they were never taught, actually, the, 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 about atrocities, about, about the failed economies. Uh, I think that in this case, we already lost cultural war with, um, uh, with socialists uh, in the United States. If you will look, the anti-capitalist mentality is ruling supreme in, in our, on campuses of our colleges colleges and universities. <clears throat> well, there is some excuse. I think if you remember Winston Churchill, he used to say that if you are 20 and you are not a socialist, you do not have a heart. But if you are 30 and still a socialist, you don't have a brain. Yeah. So that's, I think, is, <clears throat> is pretty true. 
So now the major thing is um, that the, uh, the, the socialists, they call themselves democratic socialists, which is an oxymoron, and, uh, because you, you cannot have democracy and socialism together. They are trying even whitewash the, the Stalinism, whitewash Leninism, whitewash all these uh, atrocities in North Korea, in Cuba, in Vietnam, and elsewhere. Uh, for example, in uh, some, it's very difficult to do because there are statistics and numbers, the facts, uh, which is difficult to say. Uh, so they come up with a very inventive ways to brainwash people like this. That's a New York Times article that, that maybe life was tough under, under socialism, but sex was much better. <laughs> much better. And how did they came up with this idiotic conclusion? Uh, is that they were interviewing old babushkas in Eastern Europe and former Soviet Union, asking if they had a better sex under socialism, that means 30 years ago, or they have a better sex under capitalism when they are 75 years old or so. <laughs> so this, <laughs> and this is published in New York Times, and this is a study conducted using federal, federal research money of National Scientific Foundation by University of Pennsylvania, which is an which is a, is a Ivy League school. So um, the Washington Post right now is running a series of articles. It's time to give socialism a try. So it's, uh, it's, it's, it's just, uh, just unbelievable. Uh, we have uh, people who uh, who I think in any other country would be uh, at least prohibited of owning uh, armaments because of their mental state. Uh, we have these people running for presidency and being extremely popular among certain people. <coughs> and <coughs> then um, we have another way of brainwashing everything, and it is climate change. It is climate change. Climate change is, I would say, is the most the strangest kind of lie which, um, which dwarf eugenics, which dwarf phlogiston theory of fire, uh, which dwarfs almost everything. Because even if you will look at the official data of NASA and um, uh, National um, uh, Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration, um, the global temperature increased since 1880, increased by 0.8 degrees Celsius. But if you will look, I mean, I'm an economist, I study statistics professionally, uh, the whole idea of global temperature, I think, is the most idiotic thing. What does it mean global temperature? What means the temperature, average temperature in this room of our bodies? What does it tell you? Even if NOAA and NASA calculated uh, today's temperature, global temperature, temperature all over the world, uh, I don't know how they weight it. Something called Pahashi indexes, very difficult to do. Uh, but what happened in 1980? There were no NASA, no? Uh, who, who was measuring that? And it turned out, I was kind of looking, it was the Royal Navy, Royal Navy. But they have three points, not global, three points. They had London, Cape Town, and Singapore. That's all this Royal Navy bases they were monitoring. And 0.8% is what is definitely within, within the, the uh, range of error on, on this uh, kind of thing. However, today, um, this uh, green kind of thing, it's, uh, I call it watermelon. It's uh, green outside and red inside. And, and this, uh, 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 these are brainwashed kids who are saying system change, not climate change. Um, so they wouldn't <coughs> hopefully uh, get no, this or no, that. This is New York City uh, already. You can see there people are um, waving this. Uh, socials will win. Uh, I just uh, published an article about Alexandria Acacia Cortez uh, uh, with a self-descriptive title, A New Bright Shining Face of Stalinism. Uh, so this, uh, uh, she is, um, she, um, what she does definitely, oh, this is the wrong presentation. Oh, I'm so sorry, but this is not the right, the right. 
Okay, well, what the hell is that? <laughs> um, yes, that's the. I was working, had a dubious, uh, dubious pleasure of working with Mr. Yeltsin, uh, president of Russia. Yeah, and he, uh, we called him that he's dry, he's, he is uh, governing under influence. And he would all the time call people different names. That was pretty funny. And when I told him that I'm not Boris, but I am Yuri, he said, what the hell is the difference? Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, so we'll go then. Um, so why is it public slavery? Why? Oh no, this is, um, do you think you can put it in? Because a completely different thing. And I asked about this before. Mm -hmm. Said so, Ulan Butter. Ulan Butter, okay. You can continue. All right, yes. <clears throat> so, why socialism is a, is a public slavery? Uh, because, um, uh, because you don't own yourself. John Locke, uh, in the 18th century, his point was that, um, um, that you are a free man if you own yourself. If somebody else owns you, then you're not a free man, you're a slave. And uh, that's why um, under socialism, definitely, it's not only a means of production, but people also nationalized. And uh, nationalized people do not have choices. All choices are made by, by the ruler, by the ruler of, of these people. And uh, because of that, as, as actually disgusting is private slavery, but public slavery is way more murderous. Because you really don't, I mean, if you're a private slave owner, uh, it does make sense for you to kill your slaves. You will be reducing your wealth. While if you don't really own the slaves, then you, they're dispensable. They, you, can, uh, you, you can kill them because they're sick. Uh, that was a national socialism idea uh, of dealing with things. Um, then um, um, the overall toll of socialism, I think somebody already said it, it's over 100, between 100 and 200 million people. In the Soviet Union alone, it was between 43 million, which was admitted by the KGB, and 61 million, which is a product of calculations of demographers. <clears throat> so we're returning back to... to mm -hmm. Yes. Uh -huh. So we're returning back to... <coughs> uh, uh, <laughs> Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, and, uh, uh, and we'll talk a little bit about populism. Uh, because um, uh, I kind of redid this, but that's why we have the, this, this uh, mixture of, of past presentation which was made by yesterday and the, the updated one, because kind of I'm reacting on what we discuss here in, in this audience. <laughs> and what is populism? Populism um, is an attack on libertarianism. I wouldn't say so. I think that, that populism is just the usage of the world populace. Uh, using of the, of the, of the, of, um, uh, it's a political approach according to, to uh, political science today that strives to appeal to ordinary people who feel that their concerns are disregarded by established elite groups. What's wrong with that? I mean, that's exactly what, what we're, all of us are pretty disgruntled, right? How elites are treating us. And uh, today there is a boost for populism because of social media. That's the reason, for example, Mr. Trump is tweeting all the time is um, <coughs> because, uh, because uh, uh, he cannot get his words through to, to, to the masses uh, because the mainstream media became all, all uh, pretty pro-socialist or anti-Trump. Or, so so this, is a, this is the reason that, <coughs> that you should right now consume information in small bites. And the small bites definitely should be pretty definitive. And <coughs> we use this. The people, the word the people, uh, Thomas Jefferson used it all the time. Uh, so there's nothing wrong with, with saying with the people. Uh, then there was a statement made here that it's white, uh, white males with no college education, a kind of the scum of earth in the United States. And, uh, and uh, uh, 
I do kind of disagree with that very strongly uh, because, uh, because it's another collectivist uh, stereotype. I mean, uh, <clears throat> we should, as libertarians, consider people not as members of groups, but as individuals. Uh, that's the whole idea of libertarianism or classical liberalism is based upon. <clears throat> and uh, Bill Gates, Warren Buffett, Scott Walker from my state, uh, they never graduated from college as well. So that's the, uh, does it mean that they would be, <clears throat> then if you will look at, um, at Mr. Trump, I mean, I, mean, <clears throat> I wouldn't say a kind of I, I am a Trump fanatic, but I think just to, to kind of give him a benefit of the doubt, you would see that this is not white males, right? Not white males without education. Uh, this is, uh, these are people who made it better than others. If you will look at the value of household, uh, which is headed by, <coughs> by um, uh, uh, white males in the United States, uh, it's about $67,000 per year, $67,000. A household headed by a person from China or who was, um, who was born from the, the first or second generation, it's about 92,000. From India, 104,000. But these people, I mean, instead of hating this president or hating uh, uh, <coughs> somebody else uh, like that, they, uh, uh, they do, or Hispanics. Uh, Hispanics, I, I mean, I, I live in Wisconsin, which is uh, right now a pretty Hispanic state, and, and I am involved sometimes in, in, in politics, and they are extremely active, and active on the right, not on the left. And uh, <clears throat> then, uh, this is Milwaukee, this is the city next to me. Uh, so you can, um, you can see that this, um, this narrative that, that, uh, uh, that Mr. Trump is kind of very much anti-libertarian, I think it's just wrong. Moreover, I would insist that he is the most libertarian president since Andrew, Andrew Jackson. I wouldn't say he is libertarian, he is not, but he is the most libertarian in the sense that he, <coughs> um, yeah, that's uh, Hindu people, Jews. Just a week ago, there was a ceremony in the White House uh, where uh, Mr. Trump was uh, praising LGBT community, and uh, 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 he appealed to the United Nations to decriminalize homosexuality uh, in the form of some normative document. Um, <clears throat> he's praising Ayn Rand in numerous, uh, in numerous interviews. Um, uh, so this is, a, well, again, I'm not saying that he, is, uh, that he is libertarian, but he definitely read, he definitely read uh, The Fountainhead, and Atlas Shrugged, and moreover, he had a discussion club at his house uh, once, once a month. So this is uh, definitely a problem for many people, and uh, for many people, and uh, <clears throat> especially for the deep state. And I think as libertarians, we should, um, we should definitely support him in destroying this, these institutions, uh, institutions which involved us in a lot of spying uh, against each other. Uh, if you remember uh, NSA, uh, for example, no such agency, they call it. Uh, that abbreviation is, <coughs> uh, as well as CIA, and uh, <coughs> the only problem definitely with, uh, with, um, um, with the swamp, that the swamp is as deep as Mariana Trench, so it's not kind of been done so easily away with. Then, uh, <coughs> and definitely I think another, uh, another way to, to see this uh, uh, Trump deranged uh, 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 syndrome is that polemic is directed never against the arguments of the opponent, but always against his person. Uh, and then uh, I have uh, several of my students are working in the administration. One just became associate director of OMB, of OMB, and they uh, uh, he sent me <laughs> this uh, sweatshirt, and uh, he also sent me. A Trump's wig, and uh, and a Trump's wig, and in a note attached, he said, "If you don't like Trump, you know, 
whether I like him or not. If you don't like Trump, you can wear it as a Boris Johnson wig. That's probably would be a good substitute. Okay, so <clears throat> what is collectivism? What, is the, what, what democratic socialists today are promoting? Collectivism is, um, is um, <clears throat> a group thing, group thing, that you divide people. That's what all socialists were doing. They were dividing people, pitting men against women and women against men, children against parents and um, um, people, pitting people with a different skin pigmentation against each other. Um, you need to create this kind of havoc of total war against each other. Uh, definitely, uh, say Marxists, they would pit people against the rich people because what rich people are few, right? You, uh, it's, besides that, the envy is, uh, social envy is, is rampant. And right now, unfortunately, in the United States, uh, when Martha Stewart was um, <coughs> framed and and uh, um, put in jail, if you remember Martha Stewart, she was for covering a, a crime that, that was not committed. I remember my, my neighbor, he got drunk, first time I saw him drunk. He thought this is the beginning of the trend. And he thought that then, then all of them <laughs> will go after another. That's a, this kind of social justice which is which is taught in schools and public schools and circulated all the time. Then the <clears throat> Hayek, uh, Hayek's my favorite quote, that uh, he defines social justice as a concentrated hatred towards people who did better than you did. And I think that this is, this is a sweet feeling to hate rich people. Um, then uh, what are the examples? Social racism, fascism, Milit militant religiosity, reparations movement right now in the United States, that's the ultimate treatment of people as groups, uh, not only at the same time frame, but historically. So historically, we'll look at to that, and Russia must claim a lot of reparations from Mongolia because of Genghis Khan occupied Russia in the 11th century. I came from Tatarstan myself, uh, that's where the um, so these are the, the, the absurd, absurd, absolutely absurd constructions. But these constructions are, are greeted by people who would be victims, who would be on the receiving end of this kind of thing. <laughs> so this is the... Uh, uh, so we, we can see that, that public slavery because abolition of private property. So you don't own yourself, they even admit that themselves. Uh, then um, in in the United States, most people do not understand the difference between socialism and communism. Uh, even my colleagues, they would say, well, communism is bad and fascism is bad, uh, but uh, socialism is actually good. However, they, <laughs> they don't understand that communism was never practiced. It was a goal, far away utopia. Uh, even Marx was asked, uh, when does he think communism will come with a withering away of the state? Because communism, is, there will be no state because you don't need to be governed. You would be such an angel. You will self-govern yourself. Uh, there will be no money. People will work very hard for, for, for others. And he, he said that will dwarf even the pleasures of love, the, the working for free for somebody else. So this is the... <laughs> Um, but they will consume very little. They would, after work, they will go to something like you know, Sam's Clubs or other big supermarkets, but with no cashiers and take everything for free. But they will take only the, the, the least possible uh, uh, that they would, they would consume. So this is, and he said that it um, will be for four or five hundred years from now, he thinks. Marx thought that communism would occur. So we're still on a waiting list for another 200 years. And, uh, <coughs> okay, I'm smart. Collectivism was the basis of all tyrannies in the world's history. There were no tyrannies based on individualism. And so this is the, the, <coughs> the tyranny, if you will look at, uh, these are the people who, who were executing millions of others. So that's the, and you can see that. It's the, the system they're trying to implement would change them. Trotsky was a very, um, very gifted poet. He was writing poetry in, in, in French. Lenin could speak six languages and play piano. 
And all of these people, but the logic of enforcing something which is contrary to human nature turned them all into mass murderers, the worst mass murderers who would dwarf Genghis Khan um, many, many times. So another socialist. And uh, <clears throat> amazingly enough, now there is an interesting data about, about Marxist roots of anti-Semitism by Hitler. That's very, because there is one version that Hitler didn't, uh, didn't recognize Marx as his teacher, um, except in several letters, and uh, because Marx was supposedly Jewish. But his father, he um, baptized in Lutheran faith five years before Marx was uh, born, and Marx was never religious, um, but he was definitely a rabid anti-Semite. And if you will look at this, this is just comes almost straight from Alfred Rosenberg writings. Uh, then, or uh, well, this, I don't want even to read it because it's, uh, it's so disgusting. <clears throat> That's the, uh, so then, um, what Mises, if you remember, he talked about two patterns of socialism. Russian pattern means the state owns everything, including people, definitely. And, um, and uh, you have a German pattern, uh, which we are getting closer and closer to when the state is regulating everything. Well, fortunately, we'll listen to uh, Per Willen, who will be speaking after me about regulations. Uh, but regulations are um, undermining private property and personal liberty in many cases to the point that they would be just empty shells, empty shells. And this is this German pattern which we have. Uh, then uh, in, in schools in the United States and the universities, they teach that Nazism or fascism is right wing. If you will, who, who, made, uh, who made fascism, who made Nazism right wing? Stalin did in 1935. Uh, before that, they were friends and socialists all together. In 1935, he declared that, that, um, that national socialism in Germany is not socialism, but it is a right-wing ideology, um, and, and definitely it was uh, not. And <coughs> well, this uh, Lord Keynes also loved Bolsheviks uh, the way the, the Germans like. And uh, <coughs> I'm showing sometimes this to my students. Uh, without saying that it's Adolf Hitler. And I would say, who said that? And usually the answer would be Bernie Sanders did. And so this is the, the very... Uh, um, so this uh, again brings us to the idea of spontaneous order, the ideas of what is human freedom, that human freedom choice, choice, and, um, and that, um, that it's, uh, it's actually interestingly enough, I was reading recently Adam Ferguson, who was a friend and, uh, and at the time of Adam Smith, and he was talking about about the, the absurdity of design of design that that is free inter free interactions of free people. That's what is in essence the essence of civilization and freedom. So this uh, this is famous Hayek's dictum. Sorry, that's wrong Hayek. This one. <laughs> so this is the. <clears throat> Um, uh, definitely, what, the, what are the major problems today with this, with democratic socialism? Well, democracy and socialism are uh, incompatible unless you consider socialism in, 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 in a very kind of mechanical way. What does this mean? That means if you consider democracy as a rule of 50% of plus one vote, then, uh, then in that case, and Josef Alois Schumpeter, he proved that we will all be socialists because then his point was that I love, social, I love capitalism. Capitalism is providing me with more freedom and more, and more efficiency, economic efficiency, but future because of this mixture uh, will drive us to, will drive us to, to um, public slavery again. So cultural Marxism, um, I, I remember, reading Antonia Gramsci back in the, in the Soviet Union, Herbert Marcuse and George Lukas, they are kind of the darlings of my colleagues who are teaching sociology. 
And, uh, and it's all kind of self-blame kind of uh, thing. So Marxism is still around. Well, this are some pictures. I just was in Cuba. Yeah, look, it fixes up. And this is, this is an ambulance in Cuba. Speaking about free health care. Free health care in Cuba. Yes, that's, uh, I have a friend, Cuban friend, whom I know since my Moscow time. And I brought students, and, uh, and one student, she, she watched this movie, Sico, made by Michael Moore, the biggest propaganda person in the world. And, and, uh, and she said, she asked my friend, she said, um, I see it's the disaster, all over disaster, but we heard that you have the best healthcare in the world. And he said, of course we do, but we can improve still as a true socialist. I can say we can improve if we would have hospitals, clinics, doctors, medicines, ambulances, then it would be even better. <laughs> and then we're walking outside and he said, healthcare, healthcare, swim to Miami, that's what it is. And that's the, yeah, these are the, the uh, it's just kind of like before coffee. And this was, um, uh, was an uh, ISIL um, conference in Vilnius in 2004, and, and where I met uh, uh, many of you. And uh, at that time, that was, um, uh, uh, it's called Park of Foil and Foibles. And to this part of the park, I tried to make pictures, but I was, I refused to take pictures because it was an entrepreneurial Lithuanian. Uh, there was a Lenin statue like that. He built a little bridge, and people for a very trifling sum of money, for I think like 40 cents US, could go and pee on Lenin. <laughs> and, and that was, a, was a, a pretty nice response. However, it was definitely a very sexist response because it was only for men. <laughs> That's the, Yes, and these are the numbers. We talked about that in this previous presentation. Yeah. So this is the, the, uh, 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 what, what this increases. If you will look at the millimeters in the beginning, I think, of, of this presentation, I talked about, oh no, it's, all right, it's gone. But um, if you remember about 30 years ago, United Nations, uh, they adopted a resolution about the emergency of, of, of global warming in case of Republic of Maldives and the island of Mauritius, that in 25, 30 years, they would be completely covered with water. And I was, and I never thought I would be in Mauritius, but a year ago, I went to Mauritius, and here it is, it shiny and beautiful. Uh, the country which tops the number one ranking in economic freedom in Africa. So that's the... Uh, they are doing very well, and they didn't sunk a bit. Um, so that's the <coughs> that's where I would like to take some pictures, I, uh, to, say, uh, to take some questions, because I think I kind of depressed you enough already before before coffee. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. Yes. Well, of course. Yeah, yesterday, I think we, we uh, uh, <clears throat> Tom, Tom Palmer showed us the nice pictures of, of Mr. Putin. And Mr. Putin, he's not my favorite. When he was elected and relatively free elections, in the year 2000, I wrote an article in Russian, published in Russia. And the article, the title was self-descriptive. Meat, meat voted for a meat grinder. And, uh, and because Mr. Putin definitely would not like that kind of title. Yeah, why? Because he is a, he's a proud member of KGB. KGB murdered tens of millions of people. And then the people or sheeple elect the proud member of the KGB, a meat grinder, 
uh, to be the president. So I'm not visiting Russia much because if you don't like him, your life expectancy can drop like, like a rock. Uh, but yes, that's what I think Mr. Putin is trying to do. He's trying to pit people against each other. From one hand, now he is opening, inaugurating monuments to the victims of Stalinism, of Stalinist repressions. Uh, from another hand, he is all on the same side, I'm sorry. He inaugurated three monuments to Alexander III, which is just amazing for me because as a student of Russian history, because Alexander III and the communists was considered to be the most evil. Uh, um, however, uh, uh, I was reading even Alexander III and, and uh, he made an interesting point. He kind of, I think he plagiarized it from uh, Washington, the testament of George Washington, he was saying that to his son, Nicholas II, that stay away from wars. Wars is a wars and a plug. And no, 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 like that. So that was interesting. So he is pleasing these people. And from another hand, he is pleasing people on, on, on the communist side and on the extremist side, like Mr. Dugin or, or many others, um, or Mr. Grizlov. Uh, recently, he made a, TV, a statement on TV that he would like to see United States being turned into the react, radioactive ball radioactive ball, then now many, many of these uh, um, people on them. I think he's just creating a, a, a background for himself, that he's sane and nice because look what kind of monsters are people around me. Um, they, they had the same Grislov was saying that they want uh, to restore Russia in the, in the um, borders of 1850. 1850, that's, that's kind of tough, because then you need to give back Alaska, you need to take over Finland, Poland, and almost everything else. So, so this is, and definitely Mr. Putin, he looks sober and, and thinking about it. But he was, he is creating, he, they don't have ideology. That's what the problem, that's why I don't see the, I don't see Russia as a threat to the United States or to whomever else, because they, they're not anymore in proselytizing, proselytizing mood. If they would take over, even if they would take over somebody, then what do they do? They sell Putin's t-shirts, like in Eastern Ukraine. Nothing else, <laughs> and no ideas, no, no whatever. So that's, that, but that's very sad, yes. It's, in Russia we have a, a very cheerful saying that the only lesson of history is that it does not teach us anything. Hmm. Other questions? Yes, please. Yeah. Uh, you know, what can be done about the colleges and the universities? And why did the intellectuals decide to sell out humanity? I mean, are they just, are they just, do they just hate the rest of the world, or what? Yes, so they do. Well, That's... The uh, <laughs> right. It's Hayek's famous essay, Why Intellectuals Love Socialism. Uh, explains it all. I mean, intellectuals, they think they are smart people, they know better than anybody else, and this is a claim, claim um, to power, claim to power, that they, uh, that they can create society based on science, that science should be, should be guiding us, science. However, having said that, I would say science today, um, maybe I disagree with some previous speakers, but science today is more of a kind of a kind of opinion, in the sense that I am an economist myself. I wouldn't say there is economic science. Many economists would get Nobel Prizes for saying not different things, but exactly opposite. So then you have the scientists like, like Paul Krugman and other laughable people uh, who got his Nobel Prize for trashing, I think, President George W. Bush. And so this is, these are kind of the problems with, with the intellectuals that, that, that can you imagine, if you, if you are a professor of something and you, uh, you, you feel that you are a navel of the universe, and then the guy who is living next door and making toilet paper is it much richer than you are, then this is definitely social injustice. And, and besides that, as Hayek is writing, that, that they also think that if they will have socialism, they will be paid more, which, which never happened, by the way, uh, never happened. In the Soviet Union, they had an inverse relationship between education and pay. 
And uh, for example, I had a friend who was a neurosurgeon and his salary was about three times lower than the salary of the bus driver. Because the idea was that if you got free education from the state, you should work for it. You should not be paid more. Why would you, we already paid for you. Um, that's not your investment. Um, so this is, this is kind of, I would say, uh, uh, my ideas why intellectuals are like socialism. And besides that, it's a reproductive thing. They reproduce themselves all the time. For example, if, if you have a liberal department of something, uh, then they would only hire liberals, only hire people who are either to the left of them or at least at the same, at the same place. So, so that's kind of uh, academia got rid, I think, of me. I, I, I was hired I'd be, between us. I was hired and given tenure only because they thought that uh, the time kind of Marxist proselytizer came from Moscow and uh, on a mission. And, uh, yes, and, and, uh, and the gentleman who did the hiring, he thought that Austrian economics means that I was a Soviet watcher of Austria. <laughs> Any other questions? <laughs> yes? Stalin was. Uh, once again. Mm -hmm. 1922. Mm -hmm. Stalin writes a letter to the uh, financial department. Mm -hmm. And it says, what required for, required for merchants is not communist. It's a performance to get the profit. How do you see? Yes, well, I think they were all kind of monsters. I'm working on a, something called Volkogonov Archive in the Library of Congress of the United States. Uh, it's interesting, it was a general Volkogonov. He was a propaganda person. He was much, he just was lying more than CNN, if you can imagine. And, uh, and he, and then when he would be on TV, I would switch him off right away. Uh, but he, I didn't know that he had double kind of standard and he bought a Xerox machine for his Institute of Military History, uh, put it in a secret location and was making highly legal copies of everything going through his desk. And in 1922, there, there was amazing letters by Stalin and by Lenin. Lenin wrote to Dzerzhinsky, who was the founder of KGB CK. And he wrote saying, dear Felix, I'm telling Combras what to do. Nobody listens, I'm tired. What if we will shoot a couple of these absent-minded people publicly, and then maybe we'll restore attention span? And, and that was a, that's just a monstrous kind of things. Or uh, there is a, there's a, a, a person, a commissar from the South, is writing, Dear Comrade Lenin, you sent us um, uh, a message that, uh, a memo, that you, we need to fight religion, but you didn't explain how to fight religion. And Lenin is writing back, dear comrade imbecile, um, murder religious people, that's how. And then postscript, and murder them the way that everybody will be trembling with horror 150 miles around. So that's, that's how well, these people were just the bunch of, of criminals, the, of the wars, evil. Uh, in, in, in land, and definitely religion, and they were suppressing religion here in Mongolia. In China, religion was prohibited until like 1983 or something, um, because, uh, because the whole idea is that a religious person cannot believe in all this, this farrago, which is socialism, that, that you can't believe that Marx was a god if you have another god in your mind. So that's the, that's the, the then, then, then who else? And then they would go after families, and then yeah, they go after civil society, and then you're naked before them, and you don't have any, 
any mechanism which would protect you uh, anymore. Then you are a slave, complete slave. Yeah? And uh, I would uh, like to end with a quote from definitely even least libertarian president than the current one we have, um, uh, and that was Dwight Eisenhower in 1956. He said that if you want, if you want uh, free dental care, if you want free, free health care, if you want uh, free food, uh, free lodging, free housing, go to jail. <laughs> That's exactly, I think, what, what it is. All right, I would like to thank you so much for your patience. Thank you.